June 5, 1943. Since April of this year, 1943, in cinema theaters of the free world, you can see the film Hangman Also Die, directed by German Hollywood exile Fritz Lang, after a story by himself and also exiled German playwright Bertolt Brecht. The film is based on Lang's and Brecht's partial understanding of the assassination of Reinhard Heydrich, the hangman of Prague last year in 1942. The noir war film celebrates the murder of a murderer, and in its complex conclusion plot, the traitor in the Czech resistance, who led the SS to his comrade's doorsteps, is framed for the murder of Heydrich himself, and hanged. Poetic justice, for sure, and very much in line with popular sentiment when the world is in flames, fighting for survival against tyranny, for it gives vengeance, and that is what everybody wants on every side in this war by now. Vengeance. Here's a word from the Time Ghost Army. Never forget. Never give up. Never surrender. Join the Time Ghost Army. This is War Against Humanity, a series of World War II in real time. I'm Spartacus Olson. Last week, we saw how the first people in Bengal, British India, are succumbing to hunger and how thousands are marching to the cities to find something to eat. In France, the resistance finally unified under one command, Yugoslavia. The Axis crackdown on partisans did not go as planned, but did see Axis unity after the Germans had disarmed the Chetniks. We also saw how the RAF intensified the Battle of the Ruhr with yet another record-breaking bombardment on Dortmund and a raid on Wuppertal that caused a firestorm which burned thousands of people. This week, there was a lull in RAF and U.S. Army Air Force operations over Germany. However, on June 5th, the New York Times assesses the damages in the Ruhr area so far. The Allied raids of the last few weeks had paralyzed the whole area, which is still ablaze in places. Between Cologne and Hanover, there are seen extensive devastated areas. The smoke from the many factory chimneys has been replaced by another variety, thick and very often yellowish, almost asphyxiating because of the phosphoric smell of the British incendiaries. The inundations due to the mining of the Eder and Myrna dams by the RAF proved the most terrible of all, however. Four feet of water covered the streets of Dortmund and suburbs, and traffic was maintained by means of flat-bottomed boats. The mines were not spared. They were flooded, drowning hundreds of the night shift workers. The Dortmund attack was the climax. Many Dortmunders said it was impossible to give even an approximate idea of its horror. Hell broke loose, is all they can say even today. What the water spared was destroyed by bombs. Predictably, the mood among Germans is grim. Promises for brutal revenge attacks on the English by Reichspropagandaminister Josef Goebbels have gone unfulfilled. And according to the SD, the Sicherheitsdienst, the SS Intelligence Department, the German population now have begun to doubt that Germany even has the forces needed to strike back. The general mood is described as defeatist, with dwindling hope for victory. To make matters worse for the Germans, the SDA reports that the vast majority of workers are showing signs of exhaustion with decreasing work capacity. Adding to the stress of being bombed, maintaining proper nutrition is increasingly challenging. A survey of professionals shows that on average they have lost 15 kilos, 33 pounds of body mass since the war began. Yet. The demands for revenge are said to be at the top of people's minds, and war production in June will not decrease. Beyond the immediate measures that we saw by Reich's Minister of Armaments and War Production, Albert Speer, last week, this is also an effect of forced changes to the overall German economy. Consumer and non-war-related production is being closed down more or less completely, and the resources shifted to the armaments industry. The obligatory work week has been increased to 60 hours a week, and an endless stream of forced laborers and slaves are being delivered to fill any gaps in production personnel. On June 5th, Vichy French Premier Pierre Laval addresses the French nation with the information that an additional 200,000 Frenchmen will be conscripted to go to Germany as laborers. The story is much the same across most of occupied Europe. While these 
forced laborers are at least paid a pittance and put up in halfway sanitary and proper housing once in Germany, in the East, the SS continue their brutal methods for downright enslavement. For instance, when Reichsführer SS Heinrich Himmler visited Warsaw in January and ordered the liquidation of the ghetto, he also ordered an increase in forced labor conscriptions for the Poles. Some follow the same path as Western Europeans, others are delivered straight into the concentration camp and labor camp system, like the 3,000 Varsovians sent to Majdanek earlier this year, many of whom have already been worked to death. Few will survive the war. The response, like the German reaction to bombing, is however in part also increased defiance. The ranks of the resistance across Europe continue to swell as young men and women try to escape labor conscription or deportation to a camp. In France, this resistance is now organized under the Council for National Resistance, and the free French forces outside of France begin to consolidate into a joint government for a future liberation from the Franco-German Nazi regime now controlling their nation. On June 3rd, in the capital of French Algeria, Algiers, General de Gaulle, with the support of his political rival, General Henri Giraud, forms the Provisional Government of Free France, the Comédie Française de Libération Nationale. The Charter aims to re-establish all French liberties, the laws of the Republic, and the Republican regime. Significantly, it means that Algeria, which in 1943 is not a colony but a part of France proper, is once again under French non-fascist control. A similar effort by Josip Tito's partisans to wield parts of Yugoslavia out of the hands of local fascists and Axis occupation continues to be under attack. Last week, we saw how the Focha Front was reinforced by the Germans and how the partisans established a bridgehead over the Suceska River after its defenders were sent north to support the strange 118th Jäger Division. Now, more and more partisans are rushed in from the east to support the breakout attempt. In the first days of June, the partisans assault German positions on the Kozur Hill, also known as Hill 787. The German defenders ward off wave after wave in a bloody melee and ultimately manage to hold on to their positions. Meanwhile, five kilometers to the south at the Barre Heights, partisan positions are assaulted by the Germans, but here it is the partisans who hold their ground. Still, the partisans' position remains dire. The Germans pour in reinforcements and day after day the Sucheska Valley is bombed by the Luftwaffe. The Suceska bridgehead seems to be the only way out. The partisans continue their push. The only way out for the few remaining Jews inside the ghettos in occupied Poland is even grimmer. After the Warsaw Ghetto uprising, the Nazi leadership sees large incarcerated but self-governing Jewish communities as a threat to the image of authority of the German army. Thus, the ghettos must be liquidated, and Himmler has ordered all Jews to be deported into guarded concentration and labor camps or murdered by gas. In the first days of June 1943, the ghetto of Lvov is liquidated. The process started already last year when Jews who were deemed unable to work were killed in mass shootings and house burnings, or deported and killed in Bevshic. The remaining Jews all had to have work permits, and the Lvov ghetto was repurposed as a semi-rigid labor camp. Now, on June 1st, the remaining Jews are put up for liquidation. However, like in Warsaw, the ghetto prisoners have anticipated the events and armed themselves as best they can. When the Nazis enter the ghetto, they are met with small arms fire and Molotov cocktails. In response, like in Warsaw, the German SS and police, supported by Hitlerjugend and foreign auxiliaries, conduct a house-to-house -house search campaign, burning or blowing up any place where Jews are hiding. 3,000 Jews are killed while resisting, and the remaining 7,000 are captured. Some are taken to Sobibor to be gassed, but the majority is transported to the Janowska concentration camp, where after a selection procedure, the majority is shot and killed. Meanwhile, at the camp complex Auschwitz-Birkenau, the selection process for whom shall be subject to a fate often worse than immediate death gets a new boss. On May 30th, Dr. Josef Mengele is officially installed as the camp complex medical officer. He will now become synonymous with the so-called selections. 
when a transport arrives at Birkenau, it is decided whether the body of a prisoner still has labor potential or not. The elderly, weak and sick, as well as many young children, usually don't survive the first selection and are sent straight to the gas chambers and murdered. Families are torn apart as grandparents and children are marched off to their deaths. Dr. Miklos Nietzschli, Mengele's pathologist, describes this scene. Any person who had entered the gates of the Katset was a candidate for death. He whose destiny had directed him into the left-hand column was transformed by the gas chamber into a corpse within an hour. Less fortunate was he whom adversity had singled out for the right-hand column. He was still a candidate for death, but with this difference, that for three months, or as long as he could endure, he had to submit to all the horrors of the Katset had to offer till he dropped from utter exhaustion. Only it isn't destiny that decides who gets immediate death or hell on earth. It is Dr. Mengele and his staff. Two of his doctors carry out the rudimentary examinations to determine labor potential, and often the doctor himself presides. The contrast between the doctor, described as handsome, spotless, and well manicured, and his victims is striking. The Jews whose fate he holds in his hands are weak, crippled, and dirty after months in concentration or transit camps. One witness describes, Day after day he was at his post, watching the pitiful crowd of men and women and children go struggling past, all in the last stages of exhaustion from the inhuman journey in cattle trucks. He would point with his cane at each person and direct them with one word, right or left. He seemed to enjoy his grisly task. Is it really one man's choice, though? Can you hold Josef Mengele or Arthur Harris singularly responsible for their decisions where and on whom death and suffering shall be meted out? What about the men and women executing the decisions? What about those in ultimate charge, the ones who started all of this? What about their constituents who elected the governments or stood by and allowed them to seize power? And what about the motives for their actions? Is the collective guilt that I infer here for some, like the Germans dying under Harris bombs, so heavy that they have forfeited their right to live? The argument is that they started this themselves and that there is no excuse. They are especially culpable because the excuses they provide are based on delusions of racial superiority and imagined victimization. In our guts, we feel that anyone capable of such bestial cruelty as we see from the German Nazis week after week, month after month, year after year, have forfeited their right to live. Then the argument is that anyone who supports them is equally guilty, and if you have to kill a few innocent, even many only partially innocent, to purge the world from such a blight, then so be it. It is easy to feel that deeply in our hearts, because they, these people, are a threat to us, our loved ones, our communities, to innocent people, to the world and world order. But is this argument valid? Before you answer that question to yourself, consider this. The Nazis are fully convinced that the Jews they are killing, even the little babies, constitute a threat to the existence of the German race. They hold slaves and work them to death because they believe that they are waging a war to preserve the collective safety of Germany and the German folk. To them, Every bomb dropped by Harris bombers is proof that they are right. To every German being bombed, it is proof that the Nazis are right. They are, of course, wrong. It is no excuse and does not exonerate their guilt. But nonetheless, they are trapped in this delusion. To not fall into that same trap, we must be better than the enemies of humanity. If we let ourselves be guided by the same feelings of righteous indignation as they, if we disregard the value of every single human life, even those we despise, then we have become our own enemy, and by our own argument, our right to life and liberty is forfeit. Never forget. Mm -hmm.